my talk will um, involve hydrology, but it will cast a much wider examination of issues related to chemical contamination of rivers. Um, <clears throat> when I um, started um, many years ago on what was the Institute of Hydrology, I came as a microbiologist and I was determined <clears throat> to prove to everyone that the most important thing you needed to know about the fate or impact of chemicals in the environment was you needed to know about microbiology and biodegradation and hydrology was hardly likely to be terribly important. That's how I started. So um, the scenario um, I want to describe is related to the discharge of chemicals from the domestic home. Now, previously, a big problem with rivers and water quality was heavy industry and leading to very unpleasant, highly acutely toxic chemicals reaching our rivers. And with the change in the economy and decline in heavy industry, that threat has diminished for the rivers. However, from our homes, we use far more chemical products and pharmaceuticals than um, ever before. And the average wastewater effluent would probably contain several thousand different chemicals discharged into rivers after wastewater treatment. But essentially, this is seen as um, a major challenge to the health of our rivers. So if we're asked to predict exposure and impacts from any of these chemicals in our rivers, we appear to have rather a daunting list of issues we need to study and resolve. These include questions over the consumption or loss of the chemical in the home. So for example, if it's a hormone, we need to know about excretion rates. Between uh, you and I and the river is wastewater treatment. So you need to know something about the removal rates in wastewater treatment works, which can vary with different types of treatment. You'd want to be able to understand the biotic or abiotic degradation rates in the river something I had thought was critical. There was also the loss of compounds, particularly if they're hydrophobic to riverbed sediments. And then of course, there's dilution in the river. So we've got a lot on our plate if we want to predict the likely impacts of chemicals in our rivers. So to illustrate this sort of field, I'm going to discuss this morning one story in particular. And it's about comparing Japan with England. And it's with respect to the um, story of endocrine disruption in the rivers. Now, endocrine disruption means disruption of hormones we're all uh, vertebrates, very, very sensitive to changes in hormones. And we're looking at natural and synthetic estrogens. These are the principal feminizing hormones and uh, play a big role in pregnancy of a vertebrate. So this scenario is that um, Humans are connected to the sewer system. They excrete estrogens, the feminizing hormones. These go into uh, sewage or wastewater treatment works where a significant proportion is removed, but the residue still enters rivers. Now it turns out fish are exquisitely sensitive to estrogen hormones. 
they are vertebrates like us, they have the same receptors for the hormones. And if you think about it, um, sniffing hormones is the best way to fish to detect when others are fertile and move to the spawning ground. So they have an incredibly sensitive nose. So you could see there could be a problem here that our, our excretion of hormones could be inadvertently disrupting male fish. And in fact, um, around about 1998, 2000 period, we realized that a large proportion of British fish, particularly in England, male fish were showing signs of a kind of sex change um, in which they were suffering from a number of phenomena such as what was called ovotestis, where you could find female eggs developing in their testes clearly not what the male fish would have liked. Um, so this was almost like a third of British rivers appeared to be affected. Now, as you'll appreciate probably from um, Kate's introduction, I've had a long association with academics in Japan. And Japan shares many characteristics with ourselves being a densely populated island. And they, um, feared that their fish were, if you like, going the same way as ours. And so a considerable number of different um, scientists were gathered in Japan and internationally to review the situation for Japanese fish. But the, strangely, the indications were, was that less Japanese fish appeared to be showing these symptoms than one might have expected and a whole series of questions arise as to why that might be. So going back to where we started in a way, you can think of several reasons why there could be differences between England and Japan and their um, endocrine disruption in fish, such as differences in the discharge from the population, the sewage treatment, the fish sensitivity, hydrology, and the use of a contraceptive pill, which is a synthetic estrogen that we were interested in, which is highly potent. So let's start with the population. Which country has the largest population? Well, many of you probably know the answer is Japan. So in theory, there could be many more estrogens in Japanese rivers than English rivers. But who individually excretes more estrogens, a Japanese person or an English person? Well, if you do a <clears throat> normalized person, which is part male, part female, part pregnant, part old, etc., you'll find that the normalized English person excretes more estrogens in total than the normalized Japanese person. And this is because of the relative um, take up of synthetic estrogens in the contraceptive pill, which was popular in England and not popular in Japan. So if we now multiply this up as the total load, whilst individuals are excreting more in England, remember the Japanese population is larger. So the load still remains larger in Japan. So again, you would expect the largest threat to be in Japanese rivers. But um, the story we're concerned about is fish in rivers, not marine fish. So really what we want to know is the load going into the inland rivers. And in fact, more English people live inland as a proportion of Japanese people. However, remember, there are more Japanese people. So still, it looks like the inland um, load could be higher for Japan than England. And if we do this calculation with individual estrogen excretions, actually, we now find the load looks rather similar between England and Japan. 
So it, it looks like the two countries are hard to separate in terms of the apparent risk to their fish populations. So we can't say that the differences in the impact of endocrine disruption is due to estrogen discharge. If we look now at the effectiveness of wastewater treatment, in fact, the two nations wastewater treatment is largely similar in performance. Um, uh, although the Japanese wastewater treatment seems to leak more of one of the hormones, but essentially the output of the wastewater looks similar. So we can't distinguish uh, the two countries by performance of wastewater treatment. Now, many biologists were saying, ah, but maybe it's about differences in fish sensitivity. But if we compare the most common fish in Japan, the carp, with the English roach, we don't see clear indications that carp are less sensitive to estrogens. In fact, we could use um, the same risk standard for both nations. So we don't have to um, put a weighting on the fish sensitivity, although both seem broadly the same. So there's no um, early reason why we should say the differences between the two countries are due to fish sensitivity. So let's move to hydrology. So who gets more rainfall, Japan or England? Uh, those of you who have lived or visited Japan might be aware that the answer is Japan. And uh, you can then try to calculate from the rainfall the uh, actual flow in Japanese rivers given an evaporation rate. Uh, I do have the values for flow in England. But you can see now that there's a dramatic difference in the flow in the two nations' rivers on an annual basis. I like to convert this flow into available dilution per head. So this is the amount of water available to dilute an individual's waste who lives in inland Japan or in inland England. So you can see the dilution available to someone in Japan for their waste is considerably greater. If we then multiply, uh, remember we've got the load of the mass of chemicals, in this case the estrogens, by the dilution. You can compare the two loads now, or two actual, um, sorry, concentrations present over both countries on an average annual basis. And you can see that the concentrations in England on the left are very much higher than we would predict in Japan. This red dashed line is the position from which very high effects from endocrine disruption in fish would be expected. So you can see it's much more of a risk for England than Japan. So of the first four items we've looked at, the only area where we can see a significant difference that might explain the change or the reduced endocrine disruption in Japan than England is hydrology. But there's one other issue we still need to see if we can nail, and that's the differences in the take up of the contraceptive pill. Uh, Japan was very wary about licensing contraceptive pills. And one of the things their scientists were very anxious about was that if Japanese women did start taking the contraceptive pill, perhaps it could endanger their rivers. So with the benefit of a few calculations, we can actually examine what that risk, how it might change. So what we've done here is we've imagined that Japanese women now um, use the contraceptive pill to the same level as English women. And you can see what the change in the concentration might be in Japanese rivers. The answer is the risk or the levels increase, but we're still a long way below where a level of um, endocrine disruption that might harm the fish. So 
we're left with the conclusion that the um, difference in endocrine disruption in Japanese fish can be put down essentially to differences in hydrology. And throughout really my career in predicting chemical impacts in rivers, I found in almost all cases, the thing you need to get right is hydrology. And even people who are not expert, like myself, can use simple calculations to demonstrate the um, likelihood of an impact. So if you were to ask me which countries in the developed world on the basis of their population size and hydrology are most likely to suffer effects from chemicals on their um, river populations, you would put England towards the top. You would also include countries like Belgium, uh, the Netherlands. Of course, that risk changes with the season. The talk that I've given appears quite simple, but it actually took quite a lot of calculations. And um, you can see the, the paper that I published uh, at the bottom there. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Andrew. Are there any questions in the chat for uh, Andrew? I can't see any yet, but pop them into the chat if you'd like to ask a question. We have a couple of minutes. I've got a, a question for you, Andrew, in the meantime, and it's about the, the dilution factor, which is obviously a critical issue in our, in our English rivers and potentially, especially in the southeast. Um, where we have um, sort of the, a low dilution between the, the wastewater treatment effluent and, and river flow. So um, what are the kind of predictions, Andrew, for in terms of climate change then in these rivers where we might be experiencing summer droughts in the, in the future? Is there an added impetus to be studying these types of chemicals and their effects in these river systems? Yes, um, you're right about the southeast. Um, in fact, I think the Midlands trumps them all. So the Midlands region is high risk, highest risk, together with Thames region and then Anglian region. Regarding climate change, uh, yes, uh, reductions in flow uh, essentially elevate your concentrations. And you're right, we, we should be worried about what concentrations might start to creep up to threshold levels. But it's not all bad news, I suppose, if you can put it that way from a chemicals point of view. Uh, a longer residence time of the chemicals in the river gives greater opportunity for biodegradation. Uh, so uh, biodegradation takes time, so that's helpful. Um, abiotic degradation can be improved uh, with temperature and uh, greater light exposure can uh, break down a number of pharmaceuticals. So slightly complicated picture. That's great. Thank you. And we've got a question from Daryl in the chat. I'm assuming, Daryl, the question was for Andrew rather than Jeff. To what extent is endocrine disruption still a problem in English UK rivers today? And has there been an improvement since the 1990s? So not much time, Andrew, but if you could just comment on that. Uh, has there been an improvement, I think, is critical. There appears to have been an improvement. Uh, partly uh, ongoing improvements in wastewater since the late 1990s and a slight change I believe in popularity of progesterone based contraceptive pills as opposed to ethanol estradiol the estrogen type pill the progesterone one is much less persistent so that could also be part of why we slightly see less endocrine disruption in British fish by the way they haven't stopped breeding uh, so uh, it's not quite so bad. Although if I was a male fish, I'd still be a bit knocked by the whole issue. Thank you. And Gareth, I've got one further question for you. What, what's likely importance of short-term CSO spills for endocrine disruption? Yes, um, that debate's been around for a while. One of the things with CSOs is they're often associated with high flow events. So uh, the dilution factors you can imagine in, uh, in uh, many rivers 
uh, such as in the Thames near where I'm sitting, it will go up about 30 fold or so in the season. So the CSO discharge into a high flowing river ineffectively tends to obliterate the problem. Uh, but raw, more raw sewage spills in low flow events um, tend to be or would be of greater concern. But um, overall, the um, episodic releases are probably not going to be a problem for the fish because I think they suffer more from chronic exposure rather than acute exposure. It's different, you know, according to what the type of chemical. That's 